it, it is a big jump to go from I think they're alive and okay to I think their body was found. Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, please do subscribe. And if you're old here, hello again. My name's Kate Philpot. This is Sandy. <laughs> she's kind of off to the side there. She's already fast asleep because I've already been sitting here for about an hour trying to figure out the microphone situation. More technological issues today. <laughs> so you might notice you're a bit closer. We're kind of more up close and personal today. And that is because I'm using the mic from my phone because of the technological issues. So do you know what? Let's just go for it. Um, this is, I was really looking forward to filming this case. This is a really interesting one and uh, there's a lot of twists and turns. The family went through so, so much and just, ugh. So this is the case of Carly Pierce Stevenson and Candelise Pierce. So this story takes place in Alice Springs in Australia and this is a small town smack bang in the middle of Australia. When I lived in Australia, the most inland I went was Gatton, which is only like two hours inland from Brisbane when I was doing door-to-door -door sales, which is a whole other story. <laughs> but yeah, Alice Springs is like a 15 hour drive to the nearest city. So like, even just the concept of that just blows my mind. This is where Carly Pierce Stevenson grew up and she was born in 1988. She was surrounded by a loving family and she had a gorgeous daughter, Candelise, who was only two years old. This little girl was the cutest little thing. Oh my God. What people said about Carly was that she had an absolute heart of gold, but due to this heart of gold, she was very trusting and pretty much trusting to a fault. She was a single mother, but in 2008, she started dating this guy called Daniel Holdham. He was quite a bit older than her, but um, you know, who doesn't love the attention from an older man? <laughs> he was quite a bit older than her. And like, I think uh, most girls like men that are older but this was kind of like that little bit too much when tanya weber who was carly's friend met him she instantly thought that something was off about him she just didn't like him first off she was like what's he doing with her what's she doing with him like she just didn't get it she didn't feel good about the whole relationship and although carly loved alice springs and had a nice life there she did always want to kind of move away, explore other places, work elsewhere and stuff like that. So in late 2008, that's what she and Daniel decided to do. So they left town. But it was kind of unusual because although her friends knew that she kind of always wanted to do something like this, she wasn't quite ready. She hadn't spoken about it all that much leading up to it. And she didn't really say goodbye properly. She kind of just left. So about a week after they left, Carly rang her friend Tanya and she was crying and she told her that she thought she'd messed up, she thought she made a mistake and it kind of sounded like she wanted to come home. So it's possible that she didn't feel safe or something like that. Um, but Tanya did say that at the end of this conversation, Carly was back to her jokey, laughy kind of self. So she didn't really think all that much into it. However, that would be the last time that she would hear from Carly. And pretty soon, Carly would stop answering calls, returning calls, and it's almost like she had just decided to put that whole part of her life behind her. But in actual fact, only a few weeks after leaving Alice Springs, Carly and Candelise would be brutally murdered, and their family and friends would have no idea. So their loved ones did get kind of worried when it had been almost a year, and Carly still hadn't returned home. She hadn't even visited or called or video called even. Could you do that back then? I don't even know. But they did get kind of concerned. So in September of 2009, Tanya and Carly's mom reported her and Candelise missing. So obviously the first person to get in contact with was Daniel because he left with them but he informed police that he was no longer in contact with Carly and Candelise. On top of that, Carly's bank account had been accessed hundreds of times and would still be in access. And Carly's mom had received a text from Carly to say that she was okay. So with this, the police closed the missing persons investigation. 
So this missing person investigation was only open for a month and they didn't even see Carly in person or even speak to her on the phone or anything. Which concerns me a lot because I don't think that's enough to verify that a person is actually okay. I know hindsight is a wonderful thing and it's so easy for me to say that just sitting here talking about it but for me if the family and friends are concerned enough to actually go to the police and report them missing when they haven't seen them in almost a year like shouldn't you at least verify without a shadow of a doubt that they're definitely okay that they're definitely alive like they kind of just took these little things as confirmation that they were okay and alive and this would be a major downfall for the case like i'm not saying you have to bring them home or anything because obviously carly is of legal age and candelise was her responsibility so it's their choice but at least make sure they're 100 percent okay leave a comment as you're watching this on what your thoughts are on that because i just Mm -hmm. What do you think is an okay point for police to close a missing person's investigation? Is phone use and bank account use enough? Or do you think they should at least see them in person or even speak to them on the phone or anything like that? Like, wh what do you think about that? But Carly's phone was used until mid 2011, which is almost three years after she left Alice Springs. So she was communicating via text with her family and her friends and basically just given the impression that she was okay and also to ask for money. Her bank account was accessed until at least 2012 in four states and territories and over $90,000 was taken from the account. But while all this was going on, there was a woman in a wheelchair accompanied by a man who went into a credit union and impersonated Carly using her identification documents. Another woman impersonated Carly at a Centrelink office. So I'm just gonna take this woman in the wheelchair and uh, tell you a little bit about her because there is more than meets the eye here. So this woman had previously been Daniel Holdham's girlfriend and she had had her leg amputated as a result of a car accident in 2008, only a few months before Daniel and Carly left Alice Springs. And you'll never guess who was driving the car, Daniel Holdham. And this wasn't all that happened as a result of this. This car crash actually killed the woman's two children. But the other thing then is, okay, if these women are going around impersonating Carly, then where is the real Carly? And where's Candelise? So I'm just gonna leave you with that thought for now. So now I'm gonna bring you to a place called the Belanglo State Forest. <laughs> On the 29th of August, 2010, there were these bike riders going through the Belanglo State Forest and they would come across something they were not expecting to come across. They found human remains. So obviously they contacted the authorities and everything, but the thing was, they didn't know who this person was, how they got there, like the, there was nothing they knew about her other than the fact that she was female. She did obtain the nickname Angel because that was written across her t-shirt that she was wearing. So initially, the media reports linked this killing to a known serial killer called Ivan Milat, who had killed seven backpackers and left their remains in the Belanglo State Forest in New South Wales. So that kind of makes sense, right? But this didn't end up aligning because these new remains were kind of out in the open, like they weren't really hidden that well, and Ivan Milat would put more effort into hiding the remains of his victims. But when forensic examinations were done and everything, they realized it didn't really make sense for it to be Ivan Milat because he was in prison from 1996 and these remains had been left there far too recently for that to add up. And this body would remain a Jane Doe for five whole years. And I'll come back to that in a bit. So now I'm gonna take you to Wanaka, which is a small village, I think, in South Australia. And this is 1,100 kilometers away from the Belanglo State Forest. So in July of 2015, another man found something unexpected in an unusual place. When you're driving anywhere that's fairly inland in Australia, there is just 
nothing. There are very few roads, they don't see much traffic, and other than the roads, like there's pretty much nothing. If you've ever flown over Australia, it is so surreal because there's just nothingness in every direction and it's just bizarre to me, but anyway. So this man was driving on this long straight road, but then he spotted a suitcase at the side of the road. So he pulled in to check it out because this is quite unusual. You, to see a suitcase, it's just a bit strange. This child had a nappy around her skull and balls of dishcloth stuffed inside her mouth. There is also duct tape and a blood-stained cloth in the bag. So, I mean, <sighs> This is not good, clearly. There is no natural way for a child's body to be left in a suitcase at the side of the road in the middle of nowhere. That is not a natural thing that can happen. So what actually happened here? It is said that this child died due to strangulation, but of course, like the other set of remains that were found, which by the way, had nothing to do with this at the time, like, there was no reason to think they were linked. They didn't know who the child was. They didn't know why she was killed. They didn't know who put her here. Everything was just a big question mark. It was just another Jane Doe kind of situation. And from the beginning, investigators believed that this child suffered a violent death and had done so several years before she was actually found. So they appealed to the public. And of course, this became major news across the entirety of Australia. And then it caught the attention of Tanya Weber, Carly's friend. And she thought, hmm, I wonder, I wonder if it's Candelise. But like at this point, she it was just a tiny little thought. She had a bit of a feeling, but not enough to say like, yeah, I should probably get in contact. And like, bear in mind at this point, everybody they knew still thought that they were alive and well and just didn't want anything to do with them. So it, it is a big jump to go from, I think they're alive and okay to, I think their body was found. So it, it did take a little bit of time, but then the police released a picture of some of the clothing that belonged to this child. And when Tanya saw this, she instantly called the police and informed them that she definitely thought this could have been Candelise. After she gave Candelise's name, this was enough for them to perform DNA tests and do all that kind of stuff. And it soon came out that this body was in fact Candelise Pierce. So this is very jarring and this is where the whole thing starts to unravel because think about it from the family and friends perspective of Carly. Right, so you're saying that Candelise's dead body was found at the side of a road and she, she died years ago. Where's Carly? Is she dead too? If so, where is she? If she's not dead, is she in need of help somewhere? Is she being held captive somewhere? Or is she okay? And if she is okay, what's her version of events about what happened to Candelise? Like, so many questions, I'm sure their minds were just going every which way and like it must have been so unbelievably stressful and emotional for them. But three months later, the remains that were found in the Belanglo State Forest were identified. And bear in mind, this was five years after they were actually found. So it's quite interesting how this all happened because they had a facial anthropologist who specialized in identifying human bones look at these remains. So with these bones, she put together a digital sketch of what this person would have looked like, like a representation of what they would have looked like, of course, with skin and everything like that. And they compared this digital sketch to everybody in the missing persons databases. But remember, Carly was not in a missing person database because the police had closed her case because there was phone activity and bank account activity. And if the case was still open, this could have been solved five years earlier. And technically, yeah, Carly's phone and her bank account were used for years after she died. So the police had no reason to think she was dead. But it turned out that this was in fact the body of Carly Pierce Stevenson, aged 20 from Alice Springs. So oh, this case is unbelievably upsetting because from the family and friends perspective, they just thought that Carly didn't want anything to do with them and that for years, she just, she moved away. She put that part of her life behind her. When in actual fact, Carly and Candelise had been dead for years. And then they know that she's just been thrown somewhere in, in a state forest in the middle of nowhere, just. 
so it's so disturbing and heartbreaking for them and I, I don't know how I would deal with that. So obviously initially when both of these sets of remains were found, they were treated as separate. There was no reason for the police to think they were linked. They were 1,100 kilometers away from each other. A long drive, a long way away from each other. So obviously the main suspect here is Daniel Holdham, Carly's much older boyfriend. He was the one that decided to take her on the road. And here's what actually happened. So Daniel Holdham took Carly to the Belanglo State Forest, sexually abused her with foreign objects, and then he murdered her. Following this, he took pictures of her body as almost like a trophy and he killed her so that he could have Candelise all to himself. Sick, sick man. It was a few days later when Daniel murdered Candelise, put her body in a suitcase and just abandoned her at the side of the road in the outback. To cover up these crimes, he assumed Carly's identity and stole almost $90,000 from her. And he did get away with it for five years. And when he was found out for these murders, he was 41 and he was actually already in prison for sexually assaulting a nine-year-old girl. And he had quite a big history of violent acts against women. He had a criminal record in New South Wales, Queensland and the Northern Territory. He also, he had a hit list in a notebook, which basically had a list of children's names and beside them had the words consent or forced. So this guy is a disgusting freak, basically. He pleaded guilty a week before his trial and he was sentenced to two terms of life in prison. Um, right, I mean, rightly so. <laughs> and not once has he shown any remorse for anything he did. Okay, let's conclude. So this guy preyed on not just younger women in general, but his younger girlfriend's two-year-old daughter. He sadistically murdered them both, and not only did he get away with it for five years, but he benefited financially from it, which is just sick on so many levels. It's obviously a very upsetting and unusual scenario for the family and friends, because for years they thought that Carly and Candelise were out there and they just didn't want anything to do with them. They believed that they were still alive, when in actual fact they were dead from only weeks after they'd seen them last and they were just dumped in the middle of nowhere. Oh, it's so unbelievably sad and this, it just angers me so much to hear about sick f**ks like this guy Daniel Holdham. But thankfully he is gone away for life, he's never getting out. He will not do this ever again. And he deserves to just sit and ruminate over the absolutely disgusting things he's done, the lives he's taken away and the lives he's absolutely destroyed because of his sick, selfish act. <sighs> Sorry, I'm getting all heated, but I, it's, it's warranted. Also in 2012, before there was any sign of Carly or Candelise, <sighs> Carly's mom, Colette, was fighting cancer and unfortunately that year she did lose that battle and her last words, her last words were, is Carly and Candelise here yet? And that brings me to the end of this video. I, I wish I had happier stories to tell, but look, thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy it, please leave me a like, comment down below. I love to hear your opinions on these things. And don't forget to turn the notifications on. Just click that little bell beside the subscribe button down below. My Instagram and Twitter are both katephilpot underscore YT. And I just wanna send everyone who's watching this my love and my respect. I know it's sappy, but look, it's just, we are all on this planet together. Let's make it as nice a place to live as possible. Like there is no need for hatefulness or disrespect. Like we are all going through our own struggles, every single person. Let's just encourage, support, and just give lots of love. Okay, I'm gone. Again, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys. <laughs> and I just froze. I didn't, I didn't believe it. Samantha. Carly. I just didn't want it to be real. I didn't believe it. But it was heartbreaking. Still heartbreaking today.